How was 2021 for your watch collecting activities? Mine was fascinating, not for the vast changes I made to my collection, rather for the depth of activities in which I engaged. Join me as I review my state of the collection and the targeted actions with which I was occupied over the past year on this episode of Adventures with Time. was certainly an interesting year. Don't worry, I'm only going to discuss my year in watch collecting. After purging several watches in 2020, I added just two watches to my collection in 2021. I think that's due to a combination of having a set of watches which truly satisfy me and the fact that I've been retired since early 2020 and the pandemic hit. Both of these have limited my opportunities to wear a watch in public and greatly diminished my visits to watch venues. If you viewed my State of the Collection 2020 video, you may remember the goals I set for myself for 2021. By the way, I'm going to provide links at the end of this video to several related episodes that I discuss here. During 2021, I wanted to finally get my 100-year-old Tiffany-branded Patek Philippe watch repaired such that I could wear it on special occasions. After several attempts with Patek and other watchmakers, I was able to get it repaired by Roland Murphy at RGM Watches. You can relive this long saga through my playlist. Although the watch has been restored to good working condition, I still need to replace the strap. After searching around for a bespoke strap maker, I am ready to complete this final step with someone in New York City. However, I haven't been able to travel into the city to review with them the details of what I want and actually see samples of their black and brown leathers. I'm still uncertain which color to get. Maybe I'll just have to get one of each. Another of my goals was to purchase a vintage watch for my collection. I decided I want a watch that was made and worn during World War II, something that might have been issued to my father who served in the Army in the Pacific. I went through a process of learning about the different watches made for the U.S. military to satisfy both the A-11 specification for the U.S. Armed Air Force personnel and the TM-9-1575 specification for Ordnance Department watches. Because my father was in the Army, I narrowed the options down to the Ord Department watches and was able to pick up a nice example of an Elgin watch, which came with the original canvas strap. Because my wrist is large and the watch is under 31 millimeters wide, I decided to get a custom-made bund strap to give it a greater presence on my wrist. I find myself wearing this watch much more often than I had originally planned, and it runs great even without having any service recently performed. I'm really happy how this entire quest worked out. My third goal was to purchase another mid-tier luxury watch, something I could wear on a daily basis and as a dress watch. I was thinking about the Omega Aquaterra. However, I didn't have the opportunity to try one of these on in person to determine which size and dial car I like best. I was able to try on several models while out in Scottsdale, Arizona, and did determine that of all the Aquaterra models, the 41 green dial was something I really liked. However, I haven't pulled the trigger yet. I wonder what that means. Other than the vintage military watch, my second watch purchase for 2021 was the Pagani Design homage to the Tudor Black Bay 58 watch. I had heard about the many very affordable watches that Pagani releases and decided to try one of these and see what they were all about. Since I have in my collection the Black Bay 58, I selected their homage watch to see how it compared to the original. This started out more of a curiosity purchase by me of a low cost homage watch. But after having the watch for a while, I've come to like the look of the watch and consider it one of my beater watches. I'll explain more about that classification when I review my entire collection next. In fact, let me now show you my collection as it exists in December 2021 and if the attitudes I had about these watches a year ago still hold true. Hint, hint, they do. As I stated in my last State of the Collection video, I have a strategy which helps me think about the watches in my collection and hopefully make better decisions. I characterize the watches in my collection into four buckets. Those watches which have sentimental value to me. Watches that were given to me and which will always be in my collection. Beater watches are of lower value and quality that I don't mind if they get scratched or dinged or even broken. 
Affordable watches are of nice quality, but not overly expensive. This category includes watches which I might purchase to see if I like the style or type of watches. I may flip these watches after a few months if I find them uninteresting or not to my liking. Finally are what I call my best watches. These are usually more expensive watches and ones which I give greater consideration before purchasing because I intend for them to stay in my collection for the long term. I have four watches in the sentimental category. A 1975 Rolex Oyster Perpetual Datejust, which was passed down to me through my father. I hardly wear this watch given it's just 30 millimeter diameter. It's just too small for my wrist. I'm trying to convince my wife to wear it. This original grain Koa stone washed watch was given to me by my daughters a few years ago. I like its rough look and it reminds me of the trip to Hawaii with them and my parents when the girls were very young. Then there is my Hamilton AT&T service anniversary watch with the AT&T golden boy on the dial. This is a nice watch to wear occasionally when I want to wear something gold in color. It is a great reminder of my many years in the bell system. The latest addition to my sentimental category is the Elgin World War II watch I added this year. Although this watch was not given to me, it is a watch I purchased in honor and remembrance to my father's service during World War II. Now let's look at the affordable segment of my collection. This group is now down to four watches, each with a different purposeful design. The Zelos Horizons is a GMT watch. This is the first version of this watch. I didn't upgrade to their second version, which had a more appropriate GMT bezel because I love the green color of my watch, which wasn't available in the new version. I do like to wear this watch the few times I travel to another time zone. One of the first watches purchased from my collection is the Seiko Alpins. This is the Saab 017, which was discontinued a few years ago and recently replaced by new models under the Prospects line. I'm glad I got this watch when it was available as I like it much better than the current models. I usually wear it with a brown leather strap rather than the strap coat bracelet as I think the strap is more appropriate for a mountaineering or field watch like this. One of the more fun watches I wear is the Islander Automatic Diver with a yellow dial. I enjoy wearing this watch in the summer with a bracelet. The yellow dial and sparkling bracelet gives life to this watch and makes me happy just to look at it on my wrist. The last watch in my affordable category is another early purchase for my collection. This is the Seagull 1963 Pilot's Chronograph. This is the only watch in my collection with a chronograph complication. I hardly ever use the chronograph feature, but I like the historic appearance of this watch and enjoy wearing it when I'm out and about. I said that the affordable category is where I expect the most rotation of watches through my collection. However, I don't see disposing of any of these four watches. Now I have three beater watches, this year adding the Pagani Design Black Bay 58 Homage watch. As I stated before, I purchased this watch because of its relatively low cost and to examine how true it was to the original. After performing a detailed review and comparison, I found that I actually enjoy wearing it and now wear it quite often. I still have my Vostok Komandersky watch from Russia. This is somewhat of an unrefined watch in my opinion. Sharp edges, loose bezel, hard to operate crown all speak to the inexpensive nature of this watch. However, that's what I like about this watch. To me, it represents a true beater. And hey, it's from Russia. That's cool. My third beater watch is one with which I had some trouble. I purchased the Seiko Samurai SRPB55 specifically to be a water watch. Something I can take to the beach and into the water. It's a perfect fit for those activities. But the watch started acting erratic a couple of years ago after I bought it, even stopping a couple of times. I sent it into Seiko for warranty work, but the watch was returned with no improvement. I decided to work on it myself and ultimately replace the movement. This actually turned out to be a fun, if not frustrating experience. I learned a lot in the process. There is a playlist on my channel that covers the mishaps and eventual success in working on this watch. The last cohort of watches in my collection are those I consider my best watches. I already mentioned the Tiffany branded Patek Philippe watch. I still need to get a new strap for this watch, but I look forward to being able to wear it. I still have my SIN 104 and my Ball Trainmaster Standard Time 135th Anniversary watches. Both excellent watches that have great presence on the wrist. 
I love how the ball reminds me of Grand Central Station in New York City where I grew up. I grew up in Manhattan, not Grand Central Station. The sin is very striking with the black dial and polished steel case. I've said several times in other videos that I think bezels add a lot of life to a watch. Even if they don't move on their own, they add interest to a watch. Perhaps my favorite of the collection is the Tudor Black Bay 58. I purchased this watch after a long survey of what watches were available in what I call the mid-tier luxury range. This is the original black dial model. I followed the additional Black Bay 58 models that Tudor has released recently, and I can honestly say that this original is still tops on my list. There you have it, my collection of 15 watches. But adding to the collection was not my only horological activity in 2021. As a collector of watches, I knew about certain features and engineering elements of watches. Aspects like water resistance, crystal materials, and anti-magnetism. But I didn't understand how these were accomplished and when they were first introduced to watches. A couple of months ago, I decided to educate myself and at the same time share what I've learned with you. Earlier this month, I published a video on advancements in watches. Although it's an hour-long video, it is broken up into chapters, so you can skip around to specific topics. I start out in the second millennium BCE when humans were devising their timescales and move through the ages to some of the most recent innovations in watches. I think you'll find it interesting. In fact, if you like to consume watch content like this or watch reviews, collecting strategies, or even information about working on watches, please subscribe to this channel and ring that bell icon so you're alerted whenever I upload a new video. Let me now turn to the future. I've been thinking about my watch goals for 2022. I still need to get a new strap or two for my Patek watch. If I can't make it into New York City soon, I will probably try to order these remotely. I'll be sure to keep you in the loop. I found the research I did on watch advancements so enlightening that I want to undertake some more education. I'm considering another area of vintage watches. Not sure what. Perhaps the introduction of quartz watches and the quartz crisis. Maybe you have some suggestions. Let me know in the comments below. You're probably saying now, hey Bob, what about a new watch acquisition? Fear not, I've got some thoughts there. I'm still considering my next mid-tier luxury watch. The Omega Aquaterra is still in the running. However, I really want to get a Grand Seiko watch. At first, I was very concerned about buying an expensive watch with the Seiko name attached to it, but I've overcome that obstacle. Now, it's a matter of finding the right watch for me. In hindsight, I should have purchased the SBGH 261 when I had it in hand and on my wrist at the Grand Seiko Boutique in New York City. However, at the time, I wasn't ready to drop about $7,000 on a watch, but I really loved that watch. Maybe there will be a watch from another brand that is the IT watch for me. The fun is in the hunt and anticipation, right? What are you looking forward to in 2022? Is there a specific watch launch for which you are waiting, or are you saving up for a certain watch? Let us know. Here are some other videos related to what I've presented here. The playlist I'm repairing my Tiffany branded Patek Philippe watch, the Elgin World War II watch, homage watches and my Pagani design, and my recent video on the history of watch advancements. Thanks for joining, and I'll see you in my next video.